I am a bit of a credit union nutter, as you'll probably discover <laughs> in, the, in the next 10 minutes. Um, I usually, I do quite a lot of these kind of talks in soapbox moments, and I usually start them all by debunking a couple of myths, but I, I actually think that you probably already have had them debunked here, because I haven't had them referred to so far today. Uh, the first one of this is that, I, that credit unions are not for poor people. No matter where I go, this is the message that I get told. Um, you, you know, uh, show me some poor people because they must be in the credit union. That's what you do. And, I, and I'm like, no, that's not what we do at all. Credit unions are for everyone, irrespective of where, what background or where they come from. And if you don't have a background in your credit union that includes everyone, you won't have a credit union. The second myth that I get is that credit unions are viewed in lots of circles, including Canadian Wharf, I think, as the cuddly toy of the financial services <laughs> industry. They kind of look down on them, and politicians do this as well and go, oh, doesn't that look cute? It's a credit union. How nice. And pat it on the head. And that drives me demented as well, because um, the, we are community-based, cooperative financial solutions to people in the community. Um, and, and I find the kind of uh, cuddly toy argument um, a little bit patronising. There are, in terms of the background to the credit union movement, there are 500 plus credit unions in the, in let's say Great Britain and Northern Ireland. There's a number of, of uh, credit unions in Northern Ireland that have just been brought into the regulation. In Scotland, there's over 100, 115, I think, credit unions. Glasgow alone has 34 within the city boundaries, including some of the biggest um, uh, and most full service credit unions um, around, in fact, some of, although uh, Richard o only put his uh, credit union statistics slide up subliminally, I think, um, I did manage to pick out that I need to have a word with him to update some of the figures on it, actually. Uh, he did say that the, the biggest credit union is 25 million in asset size. It's actually now closer to 100 million in asset size, the biggest credit union. And there's a number at, at that 50 million plus size. So they are growing. Funnily enough, two of the biggest are based in Glasgow, um, so it is quite skewed, the size of the credit union movement towards Scotland generally, but to West Central Scotland um, in particular. And in fact, there's a paper by a professor at Heriot Watt University um, who, who looked into why that might be the case. Proximity to Ireland being one thing, the credit union, credit union membership there uh, be, being a very close relationship to the two. However, in, in my uh, no doubt six minutes that are remaining, <laughs> um, uh, we were asked to, to talk about, I think, Possibly, what are some of the threats? I've got two or three threats down to the credit union movement itself, and then the opportunities. I thought I would do it that way round rather than yeah. the opportunities and then threats. Um, I think the threats to the movement, the challenges, the competitors, historically, um, these have been uh, provident and the door, uh, I come to something called the doorstop lenders, but the doorstep uh, lenders, although that's not the case now. Um, I, I find myself now almost talking about Provident in um, almost favourable terms in, in some of the places I go uh, because really they have been replaced and completely usurped by high street payday lenders. Um, your Wongas uh, and your whoever else. I mean, I was reading this morning, I think, in one of the papers that two or three years ago, Wonga's marketing budget was um, 22,000 and last year it was 16 million. Uh, and you've only got to look at the football teams that have that on their shirt or the um, television advertising, which interestingly now doesn't talk about the fact that they lend you money and certainly doesn't make reference to the rates of interest that they charge. Uh, so they're very much a threat. Our members need money fast. They need to get it. And that's very often one of the ports of call. So trying to move them away from there, that is another trend that we've seen coming from the credit union movement. It's not coming from the credit union movement, but started. We saw it in the credit union movement in America and North America, and very quickly it's, it's moved across to us here. Another uh, threat to us, I think, is the burden of regulation. There's no question that you might say credit unions have a fairly light touch regulatory uh, regime, uh, but that's perhaps not necessarily proportionate <coughs> To the actual size of the of the credit union themselves, and the and the, that burden of regulation, of course, is never decreasing; it's consistently increasing. And there's talk now as we move from the FSA to the two, the Prudential Conduct Authority and the and the PRA, the Prudential Regulatory Authority. Then, actual fact, it may just double rather than uh, rather than uh, stay the same. 
The third, and, and I think the most probably the most interesting threat of them all, I think, is that credit unions themselves are probably quite a big threat to themselves. Um, there's quite an adage, really, and um, you know, being in, in Scotland, you, you, some of you will appreciate this, and particularly in Glasgow, they like to be fighting someone. And if there isn't a common enemy that they can all unite against, well, we'll just have a good scrap amongst ourselves <laughs> because, um, <laughs> you, you know, that's the, that's the way to go about it. Uh, so really, for a group of cooperatives, at times, we don't really speak with the one voice or get, get ourselves act, uh, act, act together. Um, uh, and I think... Um, also, if you look at the, who, which group of organisations has availed themselves most of the financial services compensation scheme since it, since it was set up, sadly, in terms of number, it would certainly be the credit union movement. Obviously, the building societies have, have resolved their issues in a slightly different way by forcing mergers. Um, and the value that's gone to the compensation scheme in credit union terms is, of course, uh, pretty small, but the, num the number were there. However, let's move on to the opportunities. And um, I think consolidation of the credit union are, is essential. We need to get, um, we, we would all talk this morning about locally based banking services, but there needs to be a level of sustainability. There has to be a kind of size that needs to be reached. And a lot of the credit unions are not at that size. So if we could have a uh, wider membership bases providing diverse spread of members in terms of the saving and lending appetites, and we're getting that now with a change to the uh, to the rules and the regulations from January this year, we can effectively combine common bonds, which we were unable to do before. And hopefully that will kickstart that. Um, the other lesson that I think we can perhaps learn from around the world, credit unions there, that they really only started to grow um, considerably when they were able to offer full transactional services uh, to their membership. At the moment, with the exception of about 20 credit unions in the UK, the others only offer savings and loans products I like the building societies in a lot of ways. Um, it's how do we get the credit unions to be able to offer that full transactional service, I think, is one of the key. And it happens in America, but they pay for their financial services there. They pay for their current account. Traditionally, we've thought we don't pay to have our current account running here. Of course, the people who were paying for that were the people who could least afford it in terms of the penalty charges and whatever else. Um, but the prepaid card market is massive now. So people are starting to start to have to pay directly for their transactional services. Is this something that perhaps will be able to be used towards getting um, credit unions more into that uh, area of the marketplace? I'm not sure. Can we get into that space? Can we get Visa and MasterCard? Can we get involved there? Payments all over the internet. Um, all very different ways of having to get into that market now when perhaps credit unions abroad did when it was checks and other, uh, other services based on paper. Can the national, I know this is an odd question to ask you here because we've just done the survey of who has a bank account with which and I have, a, I suppose, in foot in both camps since I have a, an account with the Royal Bank of Scotland and a credit union account because uh, we, we can do that. Um, but I've actually always found the Royal Bank of Scotland to have been the bankers of, with Scott West Credit Union for uh, 12 to 15 years now to actually be very helpful to us and amenable to trying to, to meet our aims, certainly trying to give us deposit rates and offering us extra services uh, where they can. I certainly am not here to defend them on anything other than my credit union relationship with them, uh, but they have indicated willingness to be of assistance there. And I suppose the Scottish government or, or the national government as well uh, we've always had good assistance from them. Could they perhaps provide some sort of Sunday, the funding to access the consolidation of the payment service providers that the credit union movement might need? Again, a kind of unanswered question there. And, and one final thought, if that's my nine and a half minutes yeah. looking like on uh, the watch there. Um, I think Scotland here is the driving force behind the credit union movement. Um, the, 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 I, say, I don't want to offend anyone, but really I think the biggest and the best of the credit unions are located up here. It makes sense for the innovation uh, initiative and development to be driven forward from here because of the level of the movement. One in five uh, one in five citizens of Glasgow is a member of a credit union, so the penetration level in Glasgow is particularly high, whereas nationally it's, it's something like one in 200. Um, but what it has to be, I think, is that the individuals involved and the credit union being a cooperative of people have to determine what they want to do and to drive that forward. The part of the problem, I think, at the moment is the credit union movement is viewed partly as a tool of the government to um, deliver services that they wanted to pull out of thinking perhaps of the post office account, for example, and how do we get benefits out to people now? Oh, I know, let's just get the credit unions to do it. That's what they'll do. Um, and I, 
while there is a role for us in that, I don't think that's the whole thing. And I think the involvement of the actual individuals in the credit union within the cooperative will help to drive that forward. Thank you very much. Well, so would you like to... Oh, oh, sorry, yeah. I've been asked to find the roving mic before you start. Ah, uh, fine, OK. okay because right. otherwise the, the audio won't be... The audio won't pick up, right, sorry. certainly. Well, we, we, the gentleman uh, with the white shirt, I think... Uh, can I just say, kick us off. I'm supposed to write down proposals which come out of this meeting, so I, I don't know if that's the, the sort of direction you've got, but that's why I've got a bit of paper up there to sort of take it into ah. the, other, the other meeting and say, these are the things we think you should do. Right, OK, we've been challenged to come up with proposals. Well, what I'm going to say concerns uh, first Danielle and also you, Rod. We Could you hold the mic? We I can think I can say uh, that for most of us, if not all of us, we hate the banks, but unfortunately we need them. Okay? Now, if there were alternatives which offered the transactional service, a lot more people, I think, would actually move their money. Uh, now, one thing that stands out to me, uh, as someone who has been involved in computers, is the credit unions, between they're all fragmented and all over the country, but together, if there were a clearing system between them, like the banks, uh, they would, could soon grow and, uh, uh, you know, offer trans, uh, they could offer uh, services like the banks and then be connected with the banking system and more and more people would leave the banks and uh, join credit unions. For example, at a certain level, I'd be quite prepared to have my, my pension paid into, the, uh, uh, into a credit union, but at present I, d I depend on the bank. <laughs> uh, and uh, so why can't we initiate having a clearing system between the credit unions. Now, I've, I've spoken to one or two credit unions local to me, but there seems to be complacency with a capital C. Uh, you know, they're very self-satisfied at what they've done, you know, uh, uh, but they, they don't seem to have the uh, drive to move any further. Now, uh, joining up these credit unions by a clearing system like the banks and giving them more powers and slowly pressurizing the government for less regulation, would not th this be the way forward to giving the banks some realistic competition? Okay, well, Rod, that, would you like to respond? Uh, I think in general terms, I, I, I would agree with, with what you, you were saying. How can we get the credit unions really to offer the transactional services that are required? Um, and I think probably, I don't. I'm not an expert on the clearing system or anything like that. I think that was more to do with checks and that kind of thing. I think the the transactional services that offered now through the likes of the Visa and the Mastercard switches that need to be done to do that, and the debit cards and that kind of thing that run off. That's probably more of the direction that would like to go in. That is a direction I would like the credit union movement to to move into. Do you have anything to to add to that, Danny? Yeah, I'd just say that um, yeah, there is a massive problem in the kind of the inequality in the provision of services and I think it's a, it's a lot of it I mean there are still lots of people that don't even know about you know 99% of people are totally unaware that credit unions even exist so we have a big kind of marketing problem and I think the thing about um, campaigning is is often about making noise and um, I think as soon as people see that there is this this outlet and I suppose the reason that I don't normally do like polls of people is because I think there is this, you know, this idea that like y you can, um, you can do a bit of both and you ha can have a credit union account as well as your, you know, and if you put your savings in Triodos, it's all like, I guess that's how we kind of get around in, in kind of campaigning terms around the kind of inequality of, um, of services and use it as a mechanism to push credit unions. Um, I mean, I've been shocked, like, yeah, the trade, Abcall, the trade body have just been like not very helpful i'm like <laughs> what i'm Sorry. i'm basically uh, we're not members it's okay please oh, right. feel yeah, free yeah, yeah. please feel free to say i'm like you your, your radical <laughs> marketing arm and you're just you know like come on try a bit harder well um so yeah well i think uh, um it's a, it's a intimidated as i am by our blank sheet of paper over there perhaps we could record that as being um uh, a, a, a call for in terms of the credit we want the credit union sector to grow but that would seem to require that more credit unions offer full service, mm -hmm. that they coordinate between themselves to, to act sort of with one strong voice and that they show the requisite ambition as a collective body. I mean, obviously individual 
credit unions might. Yeah, but, yeah. There, well, I mean, there's a pilot project in that in the moment to, uh, up here between the credit union, or my credit union in the west of Scotland, and the credit union here in Edinburgh, which covers Lothian and Borders. Uh, when this is, is, is going, w it would be possible for us to have what they call in America joint branching, uh, which would be you could go into either one or the other to utilise. And I think we are driving that as the first step, perhaps, along this kind of route. Great. Well, I'd, I'd like to move on. I think you, uh, sir, were the next with a yep. white jumper. Trevor Davis is my name. Um, you'll all be aware that there's uh, council elections coming up in a few weeks in Scotland. I've been very involved in, in writing the manifesto for one of the political parties in, in Edinburgh. Um, and it's very based um, uh, in trying to develop a, a much more cooperative uh, route through to providing public services through well, cooperation and co-production and some of the work that NEF have been doing. Um, and we were very aware in the city that, like everywhere else, that small businesses are finding it hard to raise money, people can't get mortgages, um, and, and the local authority can't get finance for infrastructure and all these kinds of things. Aha, we said, we need the municipality, we need the city to establish a bank. Ah. Um, now, we didn't put that in the manifesto because it, it seemed like such a big thing and we didn't really know how to set about it and who we would work with. But there, there, are, there are income flows that are available to local authorities from tax increment financing, from Section 75 um, in Scotland planning um, agreements. Um, there's, there's people's deposits. There's, there's, you know, there's stacks of stuff. And having an Edinburgh bank to serve the city wouldn't that be terrific? Um, half a million people, there's enough there to make something of it. But we hadn't a clue. So I'm wondering if you do. So, uh, who would like, Saga's going to have a go at that. And I might add one or two comments as well. Yeah. If I, may. Yeah, I mean, this is a perennial debate. I you know, encountered it and discussed it a great deal um, while I was at NAF and, and we looked at some of these issues. I guess an interesting thing to reflect on is, again, this United States experience where they actually did drive these things up. And if I may, I'll answer a little bit by referring to what the other two panelists just said. And that is that our, what I tried to summarize really sort of briefly in a raw way was that a top-down effort, a sort of sense that, you know, with all due respect, you were saying they need to do this, they need to do that. I mean, we did that at NEF and demanded a lot of things of ABCOOL and of the CDFA and of the government. And we had some success in getting them to listen sometimes. But really, I think it's true what you say, Rod, that, and, and, and in a way, the lesson of the CRA and of your of the Move Your Money campaign is that it needs to come from people who are going to engage with it. You know, I was on the board of a credit union, and I can tell you that, of any, you know, and I've been involved in a lot of different social groups and, 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 and so on. And, you know, without people really being activated to do it, it's not really going to work. Now, I'm sure you probably have in mind that Essex, County Council actually discussed, yeah, precisely. And, and, and I think that, you know, while intellectually and, and theoretically and, and clearly in terms of identifying the need and the problem, it fits. But I think we're in a situation where we need actually to have a much broader base of knowledge amongst communities and a much more tightly knit um, sense of a sort of a cohesive purpose that credit unions at their best really reflect very, very effectively. But, you know, credit unions and other organizations, when they're not really reflecting those um, principles and values, really struggle. So I think that, you know, I sympathize with it. I would love to see a, a municipal. I wrote a paper at NEF called The Ecology of Finance. And you can probably guess what I was sort of getting at um, for the country. But really on reflection, I think that what you would need first and foremost is people who are demanding it and people who are demanding that, you know, it's developed. And, and, and the credit unions that do work best, that do have, and the community development finance institutions that have a variety of clients that have, and you know, that has real practical business implications. It's not just nice. It means that you have different risks. You have a real portfolio. You have money coming in. You have money going out. You can balance that. And there's a sort of series of virtuous circles that sort of intersect. You know, those aren't going to come about um, in a sort of big bang way if we can use another financial term. I, I'd like to slightly differ. Well, no, not, not really differing, but um, please do put in your manifesto that you want to set up an Edinburgh <laughs> Bank uh, because... 
Ah, well, I mean, you, you, your commitment could be to look into setting up at Edinburgh. <laughs> <laughs> but, another one up there. Uh, but, but, well, no, I, I, I would like to put that up. And the reason why I do mention that is because, um, well, because, uh, you know, Sargon's right, we still very much use that framework of an ecology of finance. And I think it would be very nice to test out what the public's response to the idea of, because Sargon's right, you must, people must want something, or we can't f- sort of force it on them. But I, I just, I'm, I have this belief, but it's untested, that actually, if you were to offer people a bank for their city, which they kn- knew would serve the interests of their city, I think people would flock to it, actually, if it was, as long as you convince them it's well run which is another question. Now, um, uh, to, so just I uh, invite you to sort of investigate the Bank of North Dakota in the US. You, do you know about it? Okay, fine. Well, well, there's now 17 additional states in the US uh, that have either introduced legislation to set up their own state-owned bank uh, or, to, or to look into setting up a state because they don't quite know how to do it. So uh, for those, just to, to amplify that comment for those who have not heard about it, there is... Uh, one U.S. state has had a state-owned bank, North Dakota, since the Great Depression, and it, um, it, it well, it's considered to be a success in many ways. It invests alongside private sector banks, doesn't displace them, but uh, it, it has added to the uh, the state's coffers. It's it, at one point North Dakota was the only U.S. state that actually was in budget surplus, and in no snor- small uh, measure due to the fact that it owned a bank that was making money. So anyway, uh, we, we must move on. Where is the expertise? Hmm. If the resolution is to think about it, where mm. is the expertise? <laughs> what, uh, um, I can. I mean, and not, I mean, we, we have lots of bankers in Edinburgh. Yes. Uh, and that wasn't the expertise I was thinking of. Uh, there are, I can, um, there's a, well, I'll mention there's a consultancy called Cut Loose, which have uh, helped some of the new entrants into the banking market. There, there's quite a lot of people who are trying to set up banks at the moment. There's one in Hampshire called the Hampshire Community Bank that has very much the, the backing and involvement of. Um, councillors there, although it won't be a local authority bank. But so I'd be happy to connect you with both of those groups. But I think what's interesting is you might find surprisingly around the country there are more. It's sort of slightly under the radar at the moment, but there are actually lots of groups. Metro, well, well, yes, this consultancy helped Metro Bank do its stuff. But I'll, I'll, there's two questioners who who would have, and a third now. So can we start with Chris? Right. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, that's really rude. Um, Chris, Chris Hewitt from the Finance Innovation Lab. Um, my question really is, I think to Danny really, it's how we, how we bridge this gulf. So the figures that um, Hugh Davis from Triodos put up about the, the, the ignorance, the public ignorance about what actually happens in a bank um, is obviously clearly part of the inertia. So most people, 30% of people think it just sits there anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, do you think there is anything, there is, there is, there is potential to bring the public interest alive sufficiently for where that what happens to their money so that, so that that statistic starts to come down and, and engagement happens because until we can get break through that barrier it seems like on um, campaigns such as yours and others are, are, only, are only going to be very niche activities um, I'm working on Russell Brand I think that's a good <laughs> track um, yeah I think um, I think celebrity is going to be a good way to do it if we can if we can pull that angle and a lot of campaigns do that. Um, so we're kind of thinking about that now. I also think it depends how you um, how you use that power. I mean, we like the I guess the climate. You know, we actually have some of the most kind of progressive climate legislation in this country, and it was kind of pushed through by you know not necessarily the entire country being totally behind it, but by some very you know by some good by a minority of people that were very vocal and, and you know, right. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, I think it is a problem. And, yeah, it's, it's, it's the perennial problem. I think it's, we're kind of lucky in that it's a, it's a ripe subject matter because people hate the bank so much. So I think there is a receptive audience, but it is going to be figuring out um, kind of how to do that. And... Um, I think the thing we're going to go for next is maybe like a viral stickering campaign. And so there's lots of little like, because you can do that if you're not an NGO and, you know, <laughs> don't have like people to account to. I, I always wanted somebody to produce some stickers that said, uh, Barclays, we enjoy taking you for a ride to put on the Barclays bikes in, in London. <laughs> Perhaps you could do that one. I'll give you that one for free. Yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Should I just add, move your money on? Oh, well, I that, would, that would make sense. Yes. <laughs> That's true. Good point. So... 
Yeah, just a couple of quick points. Uh, on the subject of municipal banks, uh, I know there was a lot of work done in Ireland by the late Richard Douthwaite, oh, yeah. uh, who sadly died towards the end of last year, uh, Liquidity Network, and Richard was close to getting a couple of local authorities in Ireland on board to do just this, to have their own local currency and, and, and start having a municipal bank. It's be worth uh, checking that out. Um, uh, liqui liquidity Network, Richard Douthwaite. I don't know where that is now, because I know he had several people working with him. Um, on the issue of, you know, I naively thought coming along this afternoon, I'd be given the ABC of how to set up your, your local bank. <laughs> but really, I think uh, we talk, we've talked a lot today about the ignorance around money. I think there's a lot of ignorance about how do you set up a bank? I've been in business most of my life, and I know how to set up shops and restaurants. I wouldn't have a clue how to set up a bank, but why not? You know, if people can set up shops, why can't they set up banks? But of course, the public perception is, oh no, that's for the big boys. Um, and we have credit unions and we wear them, but um, they haven't made that breakthrough into the sort of full transactional stuff. So really, I think we need, uh, the knowledge needs to be out there is how do you do it? I mean, because I'm wondering, is there legal obstructions? I'm imagining that there are serious legal, legal obstructions to be put in the place of a community that wishes to set up its own full transactional bank service. Uh, but I don't know what that is. So <coughs> the, the knowledge just isn't out there to enable people to sort of uh, begin to plan a strategy. Um, okay, that was... Uh, Can I say something about the Bank of Dave? Something yeah. you can already do. It's, it's, it's finding out what you can do now and what uh, we need to push the politicians for. Mm. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk about this later if you want to. Well, I just want to see if the panel have got anything to add to that. Danny, you... Yeah, so there was um, this is a guy called Dave um, who's setting up <laughs> the Bank of Dave in, in Bradford um, who, uh, and I think it's, see the Channel 4 or ITV that are making... Yeah. that are making a documentary about it. And so that's, um, so they've been following him round on his kind of mission to set up um, this Bank of Dave, which I think is going to be a really interesting, um, you know, Bank of Dave. Um, Attached to the TV show. Yeah, surely. <laughs> surely it shouldn't be Channel 4. <laughs> it should be Dave. Well, and actually, I'm going to refer back to, I think you're, you're you know, you're absolutely right in what you say. And... Uh, the consultancy, as I mentioned, cut loose that that, that helped Metro Bank enter the market. I, when we first met them a couple of years ago, we had a meeting with them to chat about all this stuff. They had about half a dozen groups of people who were actively trying to set up a bank. Now I I, I saw them earlier this week. I think they're up to about forty forty five. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, you know, that's why I say it's sort of below the radar. But there are lots of. So I, I don't know whether what might be helpful in this regard is a, some sort of forum for people who are trying to set up banks to learn from each other. And maybe that's something as Neff we should sort of think about. And maybe we can put that on the list. <laughs> but um, that's what we could do. So, uh, but, but, however, the other thing which needs to go on that list is the FSA doesn't want banks. Doesn't want, sorry, doesn't want new banks, doesn't want small banks. It just doesn't. I mean, it doesn't say that officially, but unofficially, that's pretty well what it says. We don't like small banks, don't want them. And where you do have smaller banks... Um, you know, such as Charity Bank, for example, I mean, the way that they're regulated is very, very harsh. Um, they're really constrained compared to the, you know, they're, they're made to keep huge amounts of uh, their assets in, in liquid form in the way that Barclays isn't sort of thing. So they have, this, they're, they're discriminated against. So there needs to be pressure political to... Pressure on the back, yeah, on the well, yes, yeah, it's a political question. And political, politicians sort of understand this idea that, well, you, you, should, you should lower the entry, the barriers of entry to business people as well as community groups, you know, all incomers would be helpful into this market to sort of offer a choice. So I think it's very, oh, Sargon, yeah. I, I, I want to add something to that as well, and it's sort of a word of caution. Um, where you look at in the in economies and the sort of in institutional structures, though places like Germany, like, and in very different sense and and method of, method of working, Italy with the... Um, Case, ca, uh, the case, the cajas in Spain, the caisse d'épargne, I can never pronounce that in France, the, the sparkasa, you know, what you have is a civic underpinning of these banks. And remember, I mean, I mean for a start, if you said, who, where's the expertise? I would say it's right there. Credit unions and CDFIs and a lot of people, yeah. a lot of actually what gave them a burst was the dismantling of the branch um, network. And there was a lot of men 
usually, who are of a certain age, who were forcibly retired early, maybe in their mid to late 40s. And what they used to be was either branch managers or small business fund managers within high street branches, the sort of decision making that was moved to headquarters in London or in Edinburgh or so on. But so there, there is expertise, there is knowledge. But remember why a bank is different to a credit union. A bank actually sits on a small base of capital and stretches it. I mean, otherwise, it's not a bank, it's a credit union, if it's a, you know, narrow banking or is fully reserved banking. And that sort of does raise legitimate risks. I mean, do you want Edinburgh to be bankrupt? Yeah. Um, you should see the debt this administration well, you know, I, that's the thing, though. I mean, like, how, how, even if it was equivalent to what to mismanagement by a current political environment, how, how would it actually play politically? Would you ever have the chance to do that again? So my point is that actually what we've learned in the last two days is that the money system is something that cannot entirely leave the public sphere. You can have periods where you pretend to yourself that it does, right, as we did over the last 10 years. But ultimately it requires the coercive promise of a government which has the monopoly of force saying we can guarantee that we're going to tax people over the next whatever many years. And that's why this money is accepted, to talk about the last couple of days, but why we can stand behind the banking system, why we can issue debt to bail it out when it, when it screws up. So actually, you know, th these are complex issues. And I think that um, while it's sort of immediately appealing to say we want a local bank, we want a municipal bank, I think that these things are about actually true devolution in some senses, about you know the fact that 98% of UK budgetary revenue is decided in Whitehall. And that's what another thing I think that underpins the social and political backdrop to why Scotland has such strong credit unions. Rod. Just a final comment. There are, there are three kinds of deposit taker in the UK, a bank, a building society, and a credit union. They're regulated the same. So I kind of question back is, I, I can, I'm coming, having difficulty coming to terms with why you all want to set up a bank when we've already got credit unions here. Edinburgh, for example, capital credit union, 20,000 members, been going since 1989, um, already well established. Um, you know, for the manifesto, why not say, well, that, that should be the organisation that we want for, for Edinburgh wide. It's, the difference is only in the governance, not, not really in the powers, ultimately. Thank you. Um, the gentleman at the back. Hi. Um, Rod, you, you, you mentioned um, that one of the myths you have to debunk about the credit unions is um, that they're not just for poor people. Um, and I was just thinking that is not part of the problem, but the credit unions, they're sort of, forgive me if I'm wrong, but the sort of average um, client would be classified marginally poor or above that. And you could argue in the UK that there's no such thing as um, financial exclusion. It's more about access to affordable finance. And we have, as... Um, Sargon was talking about the community finance, community um, development financial institutions, who, as a core mission, a social core mission, um, tried to target some of these um, hard to reach minority groups in the UK. But there, there's a huge problem around um, their s sustainability and trying to reach scale because um, the sector as a whole is um, very f fragmented, which causes them. Uh, to change the scope of the products that they're actually offering. So either be as the majority of their the government funding ran out last year and it's going to mean they're increasing their interest rates, which they're offering, or changing the financial products. So moving away from small enterprise loans towards the uh, um, small to medium enterprise loans are away because it's, uh, it's more difficult to provide. So is there an argument, do you think, that as a good use of public funds because a lot of these um, community development financial institutions, you speak to them and they're aware of the financial impacts that they're actually having and, the, and they're aware of the social impacts which they're having as well, but they're unable to demonstrate what these mm. social impacts are because all the money that they have is used for operation rather than evaluation. Mm. So do you think there is an argument as mm. um, a good use of public um, and governmental funding to continue to subsidize um, these institutions until they're able, if they are at all, to reach uh, sustainability? 
I, uh, yeah, I'll have a look at that. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree. I don't think that was a particularly good use. In, and I'm again, I'm speaking from the credit union movement's point of view, um, to try and, and it was a particular DWP growth fund initiative where the money was to be lent out and, and uh, recycled. It worked in a couple of credit unions. It didn't work in other places. It targeted, it was doing, I think, what I was hinting at. The government actually wanted us to do part of their job for them rather than allowing the credit union to be the financial cooperative that it is. I would far rather see use of those uh, or funds from central government to uh, perhaps the larger, more sustainable, more um, initiative-driven credit unions to, al to allow them to work out how we can allow them to provide the transaction service or give them the step up that gets them into that, which should see the growth of the sector from there forward. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I, would, I would endorse that. And I would add to the other elements of your question, the burden I was referring to when I said that a couple times was that Many CDFIs that were explicitly, you know, tools of social policy were bearing the burden of a failed welfare state, were bearing the burden of poor educational investment in people. They were not really giving out loans. They were doing what Toynbee Hall spends a lot of time doing, educating people about financial management, helping them access, you know, skills that they were never provided or that were taken away from them. I think, you know, you take an example of somebody who has been successful just at lending um, relatively is Fair Finance in East London, if you know Faisal Rahman. Um, apart from the fact that when I tell people what his interest rates are, they think it's somehow bad and wrong until you think about what the interest mm. rates are that, you know, the yeah, people the that he tur that turn to him normally access, which are in three figures. Um, he's charging in 21 to 24 percent, I believe. Um, and, and what they are doing is actually intervening in an area of social exclusion, not financial exclusion. That's just one facet. But I think rather than just be totally depressing all the time, I think there's some interesting, <laughs> interesting lessons that have been learned in one particular organization, I think, with, and it's probably not a coincidence that, he's, that it's led by a Scottish person, is the National Housing Federation. Mm -hmm. And there's an interesting story about some credit unions that clubbed together and created something called Scott Cash. Do you know about this, Rob? Uh, yes, yeah, Scotch is a CDFI based in Glasgow. That's right. Yeah. And one of the interesting lessons of what they were doing was that they were motivated to do it because they realized that the loan, the cost of the loan, effectively the subsidy to per loan, as long as they were, you know, going to housing association tenants was far, far less than the cost of evicting people. Mm -hmm. But often the lack of a few hundred pounds in, mm -hmm. in, in causes you know, to pay your rent causes an eviction process in a housing association that can cost up anything up to eight to 12,000 pounds, I believe. So they realized, and as an enlightened cooperation, they created uh, a, a, what looked and was branded to appear, interestingly, like, exactly like a payday lender. Yeah. They didn't want people to think this is your landlord lending you money. They really, really did mimic. And if you, there's some pu pu publications that you can get from the National Housing Federation's website that tell you that. So I think that why I suggested that actually just sort of thinking of this as you know, entirely community groups on their own is wrong is that the benefit of investing in these socially excluded groups and, or geographical communities is often felt through many different facets of social expenditure and in particular, you know, of com the community, you know, from housing to education to keeping people in employment and all of the positive, if you want an e economics term, externalities that result from that. So that's why I think the fragmentation, the treatment of community and social finance as a policy tool um, and, and the fact that, you know, government is fragmented so their, their ability to deal with problems was treated as a sort of discrete basis was really, really short-sighted. And it was a real tragedy that that's the way it played out because they seemed to learn none of the lessons of where it had worked well and inhibited the people who were doing a good job notwithstanding the climate or the environment in which they were operating. Um, I, I also just want to mention that there is a project. Um, I mean, I would, I, I, the short answer, I think, to your question is, is yes, it's useful to sort of try to measure the social positives that come out and that might justify a government subsidy, but even better, those examples where some other actor finds that they get the actual financial benefit, i.e. not having to evict tenants uh, and get them to work together. Uh, but we are trying to value the uh, social, positive social impacts of a, of a CDFI at the moment, NEF is, because we, so, we do valuation of social impact. So, um, you know, th that would... There's something I forgot. Yeah. Part of the legislative package of the CRA uh, in the United States includes something called the CARS mechanism, which actually rates banks 
um, presence and so on. They actually have a sort of infrastructure that is not funded by the individual institution that is already under a number of different pressures. And this sort of differs sometimes from state to state. And because of the scale of the entire sector, they have, you know, collective monies that they sometimes put to this purpose. But it, it, it does seem like trying to ask a CDFI or a credit union to account for and uh, deal with all of the complex panoply mm. of social problems is 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 to say well you know where, what happened to the welfare state and the role of local and national government i'm going to stop you there because that, that could get that could get <laughs> oh, big I'm issue there, all right uh, so i think there were two um you had your hand up sir and there was a what i uh, well can we sort of see if you can ask or take all three questions and then we'll go through each panel member to sort of wrap up on addressing the yeah hi i'm um, doug thompson I'm a, I'm a fund manager and i really just get a suggestion for the board as much right. as anything um i campaign on financial um sort of service discrepancies and community empowerment. But one thing that's clearly missing are the, the lack of startups in terms of new financial entities being created by the City of London. It's financially dysfunctional, as we all know. Now, one thing, this is for you as well, Daniel, that one of the key issues that we seem to miss is the fact that in terms of the institutional money management business, pension funds are run, okay, by money managers in the City of London and elsewhere. But in reality, the trustees have responsibility, fiduciary responsibility for the effective and sensible and capable management of those assets. The thought is, you go for them. Don't bother with the swingers in the city of London or elsewhere. Go for these trustees. There'll be some in this room, there'll be some next door, trade union members, retired people or whatever. Empower them, educate them and tell them what the message has to be. And they can then go back, and it probably takes a legal test case, but push on this. You could then say that a pension fund gives up 1% or 5% or whatever percent of its assets to a new asset class. And it's about community empowerment, financial services, and recreating the new engine. And it could work. And it'd be interesting to hear, Sargon, from you if you've come across that in other markets. Just finally, I would say that the been boom and bust in the past, and if you take the US in terms of the savings and loans crisis 20 years ago, mm. the number of new banks that were created regionally was into the thousands yet again. We in Europe went the other way. We consolidated. Mm. There is the room for us to be doing that, using the financial community as much as anything. Sorry, it's a bit long-winded. Thanks. No, thanks for that. And then uh, this lady just here. Hi. No, actually, it was just in reference to the Scott Cash example. So that was actually um, RBS put a lot of funding into that to make that possible. And um, I just wondered that obviously some, you know, some major the major banks obviously do find it difficult to make those very small loans because of all sorts of credit risk assessments. But do you think? Um, and I know there's a lot of campaigns here kind of moving the money away from them, but banks are trying to get more into that and doing CDFI funds and things like that. Would that make you feel better about banks if they, obviously, I know there's certain issues with where they lend, but if they start to lend yeah. much more towards the community, because if mm. this isn't going to be able to be set up right away and um, banks can put more money into that, I mean, is that something, it's kind of working with the system as it is at the moment. I know people don't you know, want to try and change the system, but... You know, just to have your thoughts on that. Okay, and then the gentleman over there. Yeah, it's just in relation to this um, issue about credit unions getting up to scale so that they can offer the, the kind of full range of, or, or a wider range of, of uh, services. I mean, is there a, a temptation that, that you get into the whole mergers and takeovers and become you know, larger and larger yourselves as units and lose that really quite valuable uh, sense of, of local ownership. And there's also another issue on uh, regulation. I think you said it was one of the, the barriers that you felt you, you faced, but I'm not entirely sure of my ground here, but I think the Canadian credit union movement got into really uh, sticky water by having a very lightly regulated system. And, and uh, you know, they've recovered their position, but... Um, you know, there was some, a couple of stories in the press recently about some small credit unions in Glasgow that seemed to be, you know, misbehaving, shall we say. They were. Yeah. They were, right? <laughs> I don't think there was no doubt about that. But so, I mean, the whole thing about banking and, you know, people going towards the credit unions, they've got to have confidence that that is a, a safe place, that, that these are going to be well-governed organisations. And I think it's really important that, you know, the reputational risk uh, that you run by not having adequate regulation. Anyway. 
Thanks. Well, I, I, Rod, can I invite you to deal with that last question? And uh, Danny yeah. and Sargon, if you can deal with the other two, which we'll just repeat in a second. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll just go first. I, yeah, absolutely. I would agree with you. I think my key to the burden of regulation is proportionate regulation. Um, at the moment, I would concur that it's been too light touch potentially from the FSA up until this point, although the articles in the press from last week did in fact send uh, quite good shudders through the movement saying actually they are looking at what these things are now. I think my, my point really is that proportionate and appropriate regulation um, is right um, and we should look at the burden of it as well and as conjunction with that you're quite right about the Canadian credit union movement as well if you want to be a director now in the credit union movement um, in Canada you are elected in the normal way you have certain um, skills and courses that you must take and pass within the first year of you being on the board of the credit union whether you've brought any particular skills to the table or not um, whether that's a way we can go quite yet but it might be a direction in, in which we would head and your, your idea of the merger the the um, nature of credit union is that uh, until the beginning of January they had to have a qualification of, for membership which led to a common bond between the members. The FSA changed that effectively to just be a common bond between the members and said you can have a common bond that's live or work in an area, maybe it's working for a particular employer, maybe it's associated with a particular trade and you can now add them together. But they don't want to have a common bond that potentially includes more than two million individuals so yeah so they've said common bond for anyone who lives in scotland no wouldn't work we wouldn't allow it um our common bond is probably one of the biggest we're about two million that's anybody who lives or works in the west of scotland so an area that was previously defined as strathclyde which in itself is a fairly self-contained economy within uh, the scottish area which is why we managed i think to convince them that you could have a community-based organization in that kind of side but they couldn't get any bigger than that because the legislation wouldn't allow it Right, and so the other questions were, how about uh, going for pension fund, p pension fund trustees to influence the weight of institutional money, if you like, and um, how would you feel about big banks if they more actively did support the community finance sector, perhaps? So some of them already do, that has to be acknowledged, but in a much more widespread way. So, um, Yeah, I mean, I think the one about the, about the big banks is that um, in this, yeah, an ecology of finance, big banks do exist, and like, it's just recognising, being realistic about the position we're in, which is that big banks have got 90% of, you know, of, of customers' money. They've just crashed the economy. They, you know, th it's just not working. And um, so I don't, to me, Move Your Money isn't about bringing down the big banks. It's about having the, you know, reducing that, you know, we will need big banks um, for, you know, in, in the state of the kind of global economy. But... Um, they shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't be exposed to the risk like we have been. Um, and they obviously should be giving more money to kind of local institutions. Can, can I perhaps put, put on the list of things, the um, uh, some, uh, you know, requ requirement to, um, there's carrots and sticks to, to sort of encourage the big banks to help community finance, perhaps. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that as well. But first, Doug, I think you're point about trustees of pension funds is absolutely right um as far, as far as innovation though i just don't see that any of that happening i actually used to work in the city too um is, sorry as, as a trader and um and uh, as a broker to different types of funds and i think that you know the, the 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 changes that happen over the last 25 30 years are so immense and so ingrained and the barriers to entry are not just like legislative but they're really you know about how the business models work and and overcoming that i mean who has that kind of capital um, so, yeah, I think so I'll respond in my positive way to both of you then, because I think that my, my, my sort of suggestions pertain to both. And I think that the role of banks, you're right, RBS actually spent a huge amount in community finance and it was a big part of its marketing. And I think that's a clue. Um, it was easier and better for banks to spend and choose whom and how to spend and, you know, the most... Um, uh, appealing imagery that they could generate in lieu of the obligations that they were fighting tooth and nail not to have to endure like uh, I, I would characterize the basic bank account exactly like that you know they said no 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 don't coerce us to provide uh, 
current accounts will will have a voluntary scheme and then you know the stories are legion of the branches where the people that had no idea where they had no material where they'd never been trained about basic bank accounts and continued to actually break the law by turning people away that they had no right to um, in terms of qualifying for that I think there's a really interesting lesson you know how Ryanair claims when it talks about itself as if it's widening access to flights and holidays and anybody who's against Ryanair is just a snob who doesn't want poor people to have a holiday and then you look at where Ryanair advertises and it's in the Daily Telegraph because the vast majority of people who use Ryanair flights own a home in southern France and use Ryanair to have a fourth or a fifth holiday a year instead of a second or a third and I think that the banks got away with a similar sort of trick um, the lesson from the CRA in the United States was the coercion of the investment literally qualifying in lieu of them providing services so Northern Rock played the Ryanair card for many, many years. And if anybody ever criticized it, they would say, we're getting loans out to people that you're too bloody sniffy to lend to. And I mean, that didn't end up too well. Um, so I think that, you know, th there's another lesson. And we were talking about this last night, Tony. CRA covered loans in the United States, which went to people of the same income bracket as certain subprime lending, outperformed them dramatically, and there's reams of evidence to this effect, when the bust came, subprime loans defaulted much more frequently than loans that were covered by CRA agreements because there was so much more transparency. So my proposal for the board um, is literally a package that A, breaks up the hugely consolidated banking system that we have that is unprecedented in any other industrial economy of our scale and size and uses the fact that we own a bunch of these banks to break them into much smaller groups so that the natural barriers to entry that are stopping innovation are in, uh, you know, reduced somewhat. And that we use some of these banking sec banks. And I have this model in my head. When I was trying to get money for the ecology of finance, I had this other proposal in my back pocket. This is before Tony joined Nev. So, and, uh, you know, you might want to search for it inside the uh, G drive or wherever it is, <laughs> um, if you think it's good. And I called it my BBC bank. Because, you know, the media, the private media industry, Sky, for example, hate the BBC because, in effect, they keep them honest. Sky has revenue of five billion a year and the BBC has three. And who produces more original output or runs a massive national radio network? I think that we need a public banking system that isn't just entirely public, but that actually also undercuts and underpins, a little bit like Scott Cash, the abuses that exist in the banking sector. So I would say we need a national bank, whether you do it from the ashes of the post office branch network or you use other you know, entities that we actually own by default, I would say that that's what we need. We need to start constructing this banking system from first principles because we're so far away from what we need, where we need to be. Well, I'm I'm going to I'm very pleased that right in the in the in the closing moments, Sargon has come up with some monster proposals to break <laughs> up all the banks and to create a nationalised bank. So yeah. I think our job is done. And uh, thank you very much to all the panelists. <laughs>